The third Sunday after Pentecost, the Gospel of the Sunday according to Luke. At that time the publicans and sinners drew near unto Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spoke to them this parable, saying, What man of you hath a hundred sheep? And if he shall lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert, and go after that which was lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, lay it upon his shoulders, rejoicing, and coming home, call together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I say to you, that even so there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner that doth penance, more than upon ninety-nine just that need not penance. Or what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a lamp, and sweep the house, and seek diligently until she find it? And when she hath found it, call together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver piece which I had lost. So I say to you, there shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. The words of the Gospel. Exposition from the Catena Aurea The publicans and sinners drew near unto Jesus to hear him. From what was said in the preceding verses you learned that you must not be held fast by earthly things, that you are not to place fleeting things before those that last forever. But since human frailty cannot maintain a firm footing in this so uncertain world, the good physician shows you a remedy even against error. The merciful judge does not deny us the hope of pardon, so we have, they drew near to hear Jesus. Publicans, that is, they who exacted or are farmed the public taxes, and who make a business of worldly gain, it was for this he had taken flesh, to receive sinners, as a physician receives the sick. But the real sinners, the Pharisees, repaid his kindness by murmuring against him. Hence, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured against him. From which we may gather that true justice feels compassion, the false only scorn. Though the just are also wont to feel angry with sinners, and rightly so, but what is done through zeal for the divine law is one thing, what is done through the swelling of pride another. For the just outwardly heap up reproaches against sinners, but out of devotion to the divine law, while inwardly they retain the bond of charity. In their own minds they place those they correct above themselves. They correct those subject to them because of discipline, but through humility they keep a watch on themselves. They, however, who pride themselves on a righteousness that is hollow, despise everyone else, and are without any compassion for the weak. And the more they believe they are not sinners, the worse sinners they become. The Pharisees were undoubtedly of these, murmuring against the Lord because he received sinners, and from their own dried-up hearts rebuking the font of compassion. But because they were sick, and so sick that they did not know they were sick, the heavenly physician treats them as with soothing foments, saying to them, and he spoke to them this parable, saying, He gave them a similitude, which a man could understand from within himself, but which, however, referred to the author of all men. For as the hundred is a perfect number, he himself possessed a hundred sheep, since he possessed the natures of both angels and men. What man of you hath a hundred sheep, and if he shall lose one? From this we learn the extent of our Saviour's kingdom. For he says that there are a hundred sheep, bringing to a perfect number the sum of the rational creatures subject to him. For the hundred is a perfect number, being made of ten decades. But one from this number went astray, namely the race of men who inhabited the earth, a rich shepherd of whom all we are but the hundredth part of what is his. One was lost when man through sin forsook the pastures of true life, but ninety-nine remained in the desert, for the number of the rational creatures, that is, of angels and of men, who were created to know God, 
was lessened by the fall of man. Hence there follows, Doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert? For the angelic choirs remained in heaven. For then did man abandon heaven when he sinned, and so that the perfect sum of the sheep might once more be made full in heaven, fallen man was sought for on earth. Hence follows, And go after that which was lost till he find it. Was he then displeased with the rest, but moved with compassion towards but one? Far from it, for they are safe, the right hand of the Most High encompasses them, but he needs must have compassion on the one perishing, that the remaining number might not be imperfect or incomplete, for this one brought back to safety the hundred will once more have its due perfection. He spoke of the ninety-nine whom he left in the desert as signifying the proud, having solitude, as it were, in their souls, in that they wish to be regarded as singular. To these unity he is lacking for perfection. For when any one withdraws from unity, he withdraws through pride, desiring to be his own master. He does not follow that master who is God. With him God numbers all who are reconciled through repentance, which in turn is gained through humility. But when the shepherd found the sheep, he did not punish it. He did not bring it back to the flock by driving it before him, but placing it on his own shoulders, and bearing it with gentleness, he restored it to the flock. Hence, and when he hath found it, lay it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. He laid the sheep upon his shoulders, in that taking upon him our nature, he bore the burthen of our sins. Finding the sheep, he returns home. For our shepherd, man now redeemed, has returned to his heavenly kingdom. Hence follows, and coming home, call together his friends and neighbors. He calls the choirs of heaven his friends and neighbors, and they are his friends, because in their steadfastness they unceasingly uphold his will. They are his neighbors also, since being forever in his presence, he gives them the perfect enjoyment of the vision of his glory. The heavenly powers are spoken of as sheep, in that every created nature in comparison with God himself is as the beasts. In that they are rational, they are called his friends and neighbors. And we must note that he did not say, Rejoice with the sheep that has been found, but rejoice with me, for our life is in truth his joy. And when we are restored to heaven, we shall complete the feast of his rejoicing. Now the angels, since they are rational, do fittingly rejoice in the redemption of man. So there follows, I say to you that even so there shall be joy in heaven. Let this incite us to a just and upright life, that each man believes that his own conversion to God is pleasing to the angelic choirs whose protection he should seek, and whose good will he should fear to lose. The Lord confesses that there is more rejoicing in heaven over converted sinners than over those who remain faithful. For these oftentimes, knowing themselves free of the burthen of grave sin, stand indeed in the way of divine justice. Yet they do not long for and sigh for the heavenly kingdom, and not infrequently they are reluctant to give themselves to the practice of the higher virtues, content in the knowledge that they do not commit any of the more grievous sins. On the other hand, it will often happen that those who are mindful of having committed certain grave sins, being moved to sorrow by this remembrance, the love of God is then kindled in their heart. And because they recognize that they had strayed from God, they make good the losses that went before with the gains that now follow. Greater, therefore, is the rejoicing in heaven. A leader in battle will have a warmer regard for the soldier who had first yielded and run away, and then had fought bravely back, than over the soldier who had never yielded, yet had never thrust bravely forward. So does the farmer love more the fields that now cleaned of weeds, bear a fruitful crop, than the land which had never grown thorns, yet neither had it ever yielded a bountiful crop. But with this we should also know that there are many just in whose life there is joy so great 
that the repentance of no sinner whatever can awaken a greater joy. From this we may gather how pleasing to God is the humbled and afflicted heart of the just, if there is such rejoicing in heaven when the unjust, through repentance, rejects the evil that he has done. Or what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one? By the preceding parable, in which the human race is spoken of as a wandering sheep, we are taught that we are creatures of the Most High God, who made us, and not we ourselves, and we are the sheep of His pasture. Here another parable is added, in which the human race is compared to a piece of silver that was lost. By this He makes known to us that we have been made in the image and likeness of God. For the piece of silver, or drachma, is a coin upon which the royal image is stamped. Hence we have, or what woman? He who is signified by the shepherd is also signified by the woman. For it is God himself, himself together with the wisdom of God. The Lord created the nature of both angels and men, to the end that they might know him, and he created it in his own likeness. The woman then had ten pieces of silver, for nine are the orders of the angels. But to make perfect the number of the elect, man, the tenth, was, was created. Or by the nine pieces of silver is also by the ninety-nine sheep. He means those who, trusting in themselves, place themselves above sinners who are turning to salvation. For one thing is wanting to the nine to make it ten, and to the ninety-nine that they may be a hundred. To that one he assigns all who are reconciled through penance. And since there is an image stamped upon the silver piece, the woman lost the piece of silver, when man who had been made to the image of God lost by sin the likeness of his Maker. And this is what is added, If she lose one, doth not light a lamp? The woman lit a lamp, for the wisdom of God appeared in human form. A lamp is a light in an earthen vessel. The divinity in human flesh is truly a light in an earthen vessel. And the lamp being lit, there follows, and turns the house upside down. For as soon as his divinity shines forth in our flesh, the conscience of every man is shaken up. And the word, turned upside down, is not different in meaning from the word we read in other versions, namely, cleaned, for an evil soul is not made clean from its habits of sin, unless it is first turned upside down through fear. The house turned upside down, the piece of silver is found, for there follows, and seek diligently until she find it. For when the conscience of man is greatly disturbed, the likeness of his Maker is recovered within him. The silver piece found, the heavenly powers whom he had employed as ministers in the plan of man's redemption, are now made sharers of his joy. And so follows, And when she hath found it, call together her friends. For the heavenly powers, the closer they approach him through the grace of his unceasing vision, the closer they are to his divine wisdom. Either they are his friends, as upholding his will, and his neighbors as spiritual beings, or they are his friends, since such are all the heavenly powers, and his neighbors as being nearest him, such as are the thrones, cherubim, and seraphim. Or again, this, I think, is what the Lord is proposing to us in the searching for the lost piece of silver, that we gain nothing through the possession of the other virtues which he calls pieces of silver, for though all the others are present to it, the soul is widowed, if that one alone is wanting, through which the splendor of the divine likeness is acquired. So he bids us light a lamp, that is, his divine word, which makes manifest things hidden, or even the torch of repentance. But it is in his own house, that is, within himself and within his own conscience, that he must seek for the lost piece of silver that is, for the royal image, which, however, is not wholly lost, but hidden in the dust, meaning the infections that derive from the flesh. These wiped carefully away, that is, removed by the vigilance of our life, 
that which we are searching for will shine out. And let him who finds it rejoice and call together his neighbors to share his joy, that is, the companion powers of the soul, namely that of reason, that of desiring, and that innate disposition towards anger and whatever other powers are observed about the soul, which it teaches to rejoice in the Lord. Then, concluding the parable, he adds, So I say to you, there shall be joy before the angels of God. For to repent means both to, to lament the sins we have committed and not to commit again what we lament. For he who grieves over some sins, while he continues to commit others, either does not yet know how to repent, or but pretends to repent. He must especially have this in mind, that he is to make satisfaction to his Creator, that he who has done forbidden things should now forbid himself in what is lawful to him, and he who knows he has sinned in great things, let him restrain himself now from the least offenses. St. Ambrose, Bishop and Doctor, on Exposition of the Gospel. In the teaching of our Lord, which preceding this Gospel reading, you learned that we are to put away all carelessness, to avoid conceit, to begin to be earnest in religion, not to be held fast to the things of this world, not to place fleeting things before those that endure forever. But though human frailty finds it hard to maintain a firm foothold in this so uncertain world, the merciful judge does not withhold the hope of his forgiveness, and has, as a good physician, made known to you the remedies even against going astray. And so it was not without design that the holy Luke places in order before us three parables, that of the sheep that strayed and was found, that of the silver piece that was lost and also was found, that of the son who was dead through sin and who returned to life, so that sustained by this threefold cure we may seek to cure our own wounds, for a triple rope does not break. Who are these three persons, the shepherd, the woman, the father? Is not Christ the shepherd, the church, the woman, and God the Father? Christ, who took upon himself your sins, bears you upon his own body. The church searches for you. The Father receives you back. As a shepherd, he brings us back. As a mother, he looks for us. As a father, he clothes us. First, mercy. Second, intercession. Third, reconciliation each to each. The Redeemer comes to our aid. The Church intercedes for us. The Creator restores us to Himself. It is the same divine mercy in each operation, but grace varies according to our merits. The sheep that strayed is brought back by the shepherd. The silver piece that was lost is found. The Son turns back fully repentant from His sinful wanderings and retraces His footsteps to His Father. Because of this was it fittingly said, Men and beasts thou wilt preserve, O Lord. Who are those beasts? The prophet tells us, I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of men and with the seed of beasts. And so Israel is saved as a man, Judah is gathered in as though it were a sheep. I would prefer to be a son than a sheep, for a sheep is brought back by a shepherd, the son is honored by the Father. Let us therefore rejoice, because that sheep which had fallen by the way in Adam is uplifted in Christ. The shoulders of Christ are the arms of his cross. There have I laid down my sins. Upon the neck of that sublime yoke of torment have I found rest. This sheep is one in kind, but not one in outward appearance. For we are all one body, but many members, and so it was written, Now you are the body of Christ, and members of member. So therefore the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, that is, all men. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Rich, then, 
is that shepherd of whose portion all we are but a hundredth part. For he has, besides the innumerable flocks of the archangels, of the dominations, of the powers, of the thrones, and all the rest whom he left upon the mountains. And since they are rational flocks, they not unfittingly rejoice because of the redemption of men. Let this also incite us to a just and upright life, that each one shall believe that his own conversion to God is pleasing to the angelic choirs, whose protection he should seek, and whose good will he should fear to lose. Be ye therefore a joy to the angels, let them have cause for rejoicing in your own return. Neither is it without significance that the woman rejoices because of the silver piece that was found. For this is no ordinary piece of silver, upon which is the figure of the prince. And because of this, the image of the king is the wealth of the church. We are his sheep. Let us pray that he will place us amid the waters of his refreshment. We are, I say, his sheep. Let us seek of him a place of pasture. We are pieces of silver. Let us jealously cherish our value. We are children. Let us hasten to our Father, who with the Son and Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth world without end. Amen. St. Cyril of Alexandria, Bishop and Doctor, on the Gospel. God sent not his Son into the world to judge the world, as the Son tells us, but that the world might be saved by him. But how could the world be saved, caught as it was in the net of sin? By exacting punishment of it, or rather by showing it kindness, so that God, being merciful and forbearing, man's past sins were forgiven, and those who had not been living worthily began a purer way of life. Why then, tell me, O Pharisee, do you murmur because Christ does not disdain to consort with publicans and sinners, prudently preparing the way for their conversion. It was for this he emptied himself, and became like to us. Do you then presume to question the wisdom of the only begotten? The blessed prophets praise the wisdom of the divine secret. The prophet David sings of it, Sing ye wisely, God shall reign over the nations. Habakkuk says, He has heard God's hearing, behold his works, and was afraid. How do you presume to question his works which you ought rather to praise? The race of man wandered upon the face of the earth. It had slipped away from the hand of the supreme shepherd. Because of this he came to us, who feeds his heavenly flocks above, that he might lead us also into his fold, that he might unite us to those who had not wandered, that he might drive away the wild beast that works evil and frustrate the unholy robber band of the unclean spirits of evil. He came, therefore, seeking the one that was lost, and he showed how foolish and vain were the murmurings of the Jews against him. And now reflect together with me, beloved, upon the extent of the kingdom of our Savior, and upon the wondrous wisdom of his divine purposes. For, he says, the number of the sheep is a hundred, here referring to the full and perfect number of the rational being subject to him. The number hundred is ever the perfect number, made up of ten decades. From the inspired scripture we learn that a thousand thousands minister to him, and ten thousand times a hundred thousand surround his throne. A hundred, therefore, is the number of his sheep, of whom one wandered from the flock namely the race of men, and for which the supreme pastor of all goes searching, leaving the rest, that is the remaining ninety-nine, in the desert, that is in a remote and lofty place that is full of peace. Was he then neglecting the greater number, and concerned only for this one? He was far from neglecting them. How is this? Because they remain in total security, sheltered within the right hand of the Almighty, but it was becoming that he should have compassion on the one that was lost, in order that nothing might appear wanting to the remaining multitude. For when this one was brought back, he had then once more a hundred, the perfect number. 
Let us explain this by another example, that we may the better explain the incomparable tenderness of Christ, the Savior of all mankind. Let us suppose that in the one house there are many persons, and that one of them falls sick. For whom will the physician be called? Will it not be for the one who is ill? And because the need and the circumstances call for it, the physician, without implying any neglect of the rest by this, will bestow all the assistance of his skill on the one who alone is sick. He, therefore, the God who rules over all things, must stretch out a saving hand to the wandering sheep, whom the Supreme Shepherd has now in fact redeemed. For he looked for it as it wandered afar, and he has placed it in a secure sheepfold, safe against thieves and wild beasts, namely his church. And praising him, let us, because of this, say with the prophet, Zion, the city of our strength, a savior, a wall, and a bulwark shall be set therein. The parable which follows has the same meaning, that of the woman who had ten pieces of silver, and who, we are told, lost one, and who thereupon lit a lamp, greatly rejoicing when she finds the piece of silver. And this joy he compares to the supreme joy of heaven. From the previous parable, in which the wandering sheep was a figure of the earthly race of men, we learn that we are a creature of the Most High God who has created the things that before were not. He made us, and not we ourselves, as it is written. And he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. But in the second parable, in which the thing lost is compared to a piece of silver, of which there were ten, that is a perfect number, or one which makes a complete total, for ten is a complete enumeration counting from one upwards, we are shown clearly that we have been created in conformity with a royal image and likeness, that namely of the Most High God. For the drachma, the piece of silver, is a coin upon which is stamped a royal image. Who is there doubts that we had fallen and were lost, and that we have been found by Christ, and through his grace and a just way of life have been again made like unto him? Of this the blessed Paul writes, but we, all beholding the glory of the Lord with open face, are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, as by the Spirit of the Lord. In his epistle to the Galatians, he also writes, My little children, of whom I am in labor again, until Christ be formed in you. The woman lighting a lamp, a search was made for the thing that was lost. For we were found by the wisdom of God the Father, which is his Son, kindling again in us the light of the divine and rational day star, when the Son of Justice rose and the day dawned, as it is written. And elsewhere God, through one of the holy prophets, says of Christ the Savior, All men, speedily my justice draws near, and soon my mercy shall be made known, and my salvation as a lamp shall be lit. Of himself, he says, I am the light of the world, and again I am come a light into the world. He that followeth me walketh not in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Therefore was it in the light that that which was lost was saved, and this has filled the heavenly powers with joy, for they rejoice even over one sinner doing penance, as he teaches us who knows all things. And if these heavenly beings, ever seeking the fulfilling of the divine will, and given to the unending praise of the most tender divine compassion, rejoice over one sinner saved, what are we to say of their joy at the salvation of the whole world, called to the knowledge of truth, through faith in Christ, to whom with the Father and the Holy Ghost be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. St. Peter Chrysologus, Bishop and Doctor, on the Parable of the Lost Drachma. They know, and they alone know, who receive the grace of the Holy Spirit, that throughout all the Gospel readings the secrets of the divine mind awaits us, and mystical meanings lie hidden there. 
For see how the heavenly shepherd, after he has sought for the sheep that was lost from his flock of a hundred, and finds it, and brings it back to the sheepfold, to the joy of the whole heavenly host of angels, brings before us the figure of the woman in the gospel, who, lighting a lamp, so searches for the one of her ten pieces of silver which she had lost, that finding it, to her gain and to her joy, she gives joy to the heavenly host. For it says, Or what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a lamp, and sweep diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, call together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver piece which I have lost. So I say to you, there shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. Do you think that this is an ordinary woman, or one that is believed to have had ten pieces of silver in the ordinary sense, or that she is believed to have lost it by some earthly mischance, or that it simply happened without design that she looked for it in the night, or that she lit a lamp after our fashion, or that she lost it and found it within an ordinary house? or that she called together to rejoice with her neighbors and friends in the familiar sense of the words, and whom we do not read she called together to grieve with her when she lost it? He makes clear to us that this is a special kind of loss, that the silver piece was not stolen, but that it had disappeared. And he tells us that it is not artfully concealed by some deceit from without, but lying in some obscure place within the house. See how unusual the whole account is, how it goes beyond, how it far exceeds the human order of things, how it breathes and smells of divine meanings, how it lifts the minds toward heaven, how it begins to enlighten us about heavenly things, how it compels us to light the lantern of a heart seeking upwards, and like the woman of the gospel search for this silver piece of saving knowledge amid the obscure places of the Lord's words. Before Christ had come for the wandering sheep, and after seeking here and there had raised it worn out upon the shoulders of his mercy, and laden with the gentle sheep had arrived at the sheepfold that was inaccessible to the wolves, the woman, who had ten pieces of silver, had long waited in darkness, and not alone did she grieve for the silver piece she had lost, she was unable to see the other nine that remained to her. For her it was a long night and a darkness profound and enduring, and without the divine fire her lamp gave no light to relieve the night. But after the heavenly fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost had poured down in a heavenly rain upon the apostles, and warmed with its fire the no less cold as well as dark hearts of mortal men. The woman, that is the church, lit her lamp, that is the power of vision of her soul, the enlightened eyes of your heart. She therefore lit her lamp, and through the subsequent labor of the apostles, turned upside down that Judaic house that was blind with the darkness of ignorance, until she find, finds in Christ the silver piece that was lost from the ten, that is, from the Decalogue of the law. Christ is the coin of the divinity in full. Christ is the drachma of our redemption and of our purchase. Christ it is who was both in the law of the Decalogue and concealed by it. Christ it is whom the synagogue both possessed and yet did not see, because of the darkness that warred against her. We have called the ten words of the law ten pieces of silver, of which the synagogue lost one. Which one? That one which John first found in the church, because he was a burning light, as the Lord says, he was a burning light, as the evangelist tells us, saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That he was in the Decalogue is already plain to us. Hear it, says, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. This word, the synagogue, since it did not see it in Christ, loses in the Father. And since it did not believe in Christ, it put Christ to death upon the cross, to whom in consequence is it rightly said through the Decalogue, Thou shalt not kill. For the Jew, when he cut off the head of the whole series of the Decalogue, was the slayer of Christ, before being the slayer of the law, 
Whence is it that he threw back upon Christ the whole body of the Decalogue? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. The synagogue was condemned, which joined adulterously to the gods of the Gentiles, rejected Christ, who, putting down the power of her oppressor, came down to her with the affection of a spouse. Thou shalt not steal. She stole the Lord's resurrection, who gave money to the soldiers that they might bury and conceal the truth of the resurrection. Thou shalt not bear false witness, for she it was who found many witnesses that the words might be fulfilled. Unjust witnesses rising up have asked me things I knew not. And indeed in no other way could they deliver up the author of truth, because falsehood is ever the enemy of the truth. So he runs on to disaster, so he falls step by step, whosoever falls from the head of the steps of the commandments, and tumbles down. For had they believed in the one Lord God, they would have never come down to this abyss of disaster. But we now follow after the lamp of Mother Church, and walking in the light of the Lord's countenance, we shall come upon the silver piece of Christ, and we shall call together our friends and neighbors, that is, the church of the Gentiles, lest they may not know that our mother has found her silver piece. And let us say with the prophet, I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. And what help it will be to us, let us hear. Behold, we have heard of it in Ephrata, we have found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacle, we will adore in the place where his feet stood. Behold what we have been seeking through far wide fields and through scattered woods. This let us find in the Lord, this let us find by the lamp of our mother. For this heaven too rejoices, because in one sinner doing penance the multitude of all the Christian people becomes glorious, and the whole character of Christ's divinity shines forth in our silver peace. St. Gregory the Great, Pope and Doctor, given to the people in the Basilica of the Blessed John and Paul on the third Sunday after Pentecost, on the angelic choirs. The summer, which is very hard on me, has not for a long time permitted me to speak to you on the gospel. But because our tongue may be silent, does charity cease to warm our heart towards you? May I say something to you with which each of you will of himself readily understand? It will happen often that charity, distracted by other cares, will still glow within the heart, though it is not revealed by any outward work. Just as the sun veiled in clouds may not be seen upon the earth, yet it still continues to burn in the heavens. And this is how charity is when its attention is directed elsewhere, so that though inwardly it gives forth the power of its ardor, without it gives no sign of the flame of its activity. But now that a suitable time has come for me to speak to you, let you increase your attention to what I have to say, so that the more eagerly your minds desire it, the more I shall be disposed to speak to you. Please go to side B. Well, my brethren, you have heard that publicans and sinners drew near to our Redeemer, and that they were received not alone in conversation, but that he ate with them, and that the Pharisees, seeing this, were scornful, from this you may infer that true justice of life will have compassion and false justice only scorn, though the just are wont also to be angry with sinners, and rightly so. But what is done out of zeal for the law of God is one thing, what is done through the swelling of pride another. For the just scorn, but not as scornful. They despair, but not as despairing. They stir up trouble, but because they love, for though outwardly and out of zeal for the law of God, they will heap up rebukes, yet inwardly they hold fast to charity. Oftentimes within their own souls they place those they are correcting above themselves and regard them as better than those that have to judge them. And in doing this they both correct their subjects for discipline's sake and guard themselves by humility. 
while on the contrary those who pride themselves because of a righteousness that is false despise all others, and are void of all compassion for the weak. And the more they believe that they themselves are not sinners, the worse sinners they become. And without doubt of this number were the Pharisees, murmuring against the Lord, because he received sinners, and from their own dried-up hearts rebuking the fountain of all compassion. But because they were sick, so sick that they did not know they were sick, the heavenly physician treats them as with soothing foments, and seeks to check the swelling of the wound of pride in their hearts. He says to them, What man of you that hath a hundred sheep, and if he shall lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert, and go after that which was lost until he find it? See how by this wondrous divine design truth places before us a similitude of the tenderness a man might see within himself, but which, however, relates to the author of all men. Since a hundred is the perfect number, he possessed a hundred sheep when he created angels and men. But soon after one was lost, when man through sin forsook the pastures of true life. But the Lord left the ninety-nine in the desert, for these supreme angelic choirs remained in heaven. But why is heaven spoken of as a desert, unless it is because we call that place a desert which is abandoned? For when man sinned, he abandoned heaven. The ninety-nine sheep remained in the desert while the Lord searched for the lost one on earth, because the number of the rational creation, that is, of angels and of men, and who were made to know God, was lessened by the fall of man, and so that the perfect sum of the sheep might again be made full in heaven, fallen man was sought for on earth. Where this evangelist says, in the desert, another says, in the mountains, which means on high, because the sheep, which had not gone astray, remained in their exalted place. And when he hath found it, lay it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. He places the sheep upon his shoulders in the taking upon himself our nature, he bore the burthen of our sins. And coming home, all call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. Having found the sheep, he returns home. For our shepherd, man now redeemed, has returned to his heavenly kingdom. There he finds his friends and neighbors, that is, the choirs of angels who are his friends, because in their steadfastness they uphold his will unceasingly. They are his neighbors also, because being forever in his presence, to them is given the perfect enjoyment of the vision of his eternal glory. And let us note that he does not say, Rejoice with the sheep that has been found, but rejoice with me, for our life is his joy, and when we are brought back to heaven we shall complete the feast of his rejoicing. I say to you that even so there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner that doth penance, and more than upon ninety-nine just who need not penance. We must here consider, my brethren, why is it the Lord confesses that there is more rejoicing in heaven over converted sinners than those who remain just. But we already know this from daily experience. For oftentimes those who know themselves to be free of the burthen of grave sins stand indeed in the way of justice, they do no evil. Yet neither do they sigh and long for the heavenly kingdom, and aware that they have committed no grievous offenses against justice, they, in due measure, permit themselves the use of things lawful. And frequently they are reluctant to give themselves to the practice of the higher virtues, content in the knowledge that they have not committed any of the more grievous sins. On the other hand, it will sometimes happen that those who are mindful of having committed certain sins, being moved to sorrow by this remembrance, the love of God is enkindled within them, and they begin to give themselves to the practice of great virtue. They are eager for all the hardships of this holy contest. They abandon all that is of the world. They fly from honors. They rejoice in humiliations. They are consumed with longing for their heavenly home and recognizing that they have strayed from God, they make good the losses that went before with the gains that now follow. 
Greater, therefore, is the rejoicing of heaven over the sinner converted than upon the soul that remain just. A captain in battle will feel a warmer regard for the soldier who at first faltered and ran, and then had bravely fought back, than over the one who had never yielded, yet had never thrust bravely forward. So will the farmer love more the fields that cleaned of their weeds now bear a fruitful yield, than the land which had never known thorns, yet had never yielded a bountiful crop. But while we do know this, we should also know that there are many just in whose life there is joy so great that the repentance of no sinner whatever gives a greater joy. For there are many who, though not conscious of any evil within them, nevertheless give themselves to such anguish of love as if they were burthened with all sin. They give up even what is lawful, ready in loftiness of soul to despise the world. They will that whatever pleases them shall not be lawful to them. They cut themselves off even from the good things allowed them. They hold as nothing things visible, and are on fire for the unseen. They joy in tears, they humble themselves in all things, and as some grieve over sins of deed, they will grieve over sins of thought. What then shall I call those, if not the just and the repentant, they who humble themselves in penance for the sins of the mind, and persevere ever upright in deed? From this we may gather how pleasing to God is the humble affliction of the just, if there is such rejoicing in heaven when the unjust, through repentance, rejects the evil he has done. Or what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one, doth not light a lamp, and turn the house upside down, and seek diligently until she find the silver piece she had lost? He who is signified by the shepherd is also signified by the woman, for it is God himself, himself together with the wisdom of God. And since there is an image stamped upon the silver piece, the woman lost the silver piece when man, who had been made in the image of God, abandoned through sin the image of his Maker. The woman lit a lamp, for the wisdom of God has appeared in human form. A lamp is a light in an earthen vessel. The divinity in human flesh is truly a light in an earthen vessel. And of this vessel, of his body, wisdom declares, My strength is dried up like a potsherd. For as a vessel is made firm by fire, his strength is dried up like the potsherd, because through the fire of his passion he has strengthened into the glory of his own resurrection the flesh he had taken upon him. And the woman, lighting the lamp, turns the house upside down, for as soon as his divinity shone forth in flesh, the conscience of every man is shaken. For the house is turned upside down when man's conscience is troubled at the thought of his sins. And the word turned upside down is not different in meaning from the word we find in other versions, cleaned, for an evil soul is not made clean from its habits of sin unless it is turned upside down by the fear of God. The house turned upside down, the silver piece is found, for when the conscience of man is turned upside down, the image of his maker is again found within him. And when she hath found it, call together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver piece I had lost. Who are these friends and neighbors but those heavenly powers spoken of already? who, the closer they approach to God, through the favor of his unceasing vision, the closer they come to his heavenly wisdom. But we must by no means carelessly pass over the question why this woman, who symbolizes the wisdom of God, is said to have ten pieces of silver, of which she lost one, and then search diligently till she found it. Since the Lord created the natures of both men and angels to the end that they might know himself, and will that they should endure forever, he made them without doubt to his own image. The woman had ten pieces, for nine are the order of the angels. To make perfect the number of the elect, man as the tenth was made, who even after his sin was yet not destroyed by his Maker. For the eternal wisdom, shining forth in wonders from the light of an earthen vessel, redeemed him, 
by his body. We have said that there are nine orders of angels because we know from the testimony of Holy Scriptures that there are angels, archangels, virtues, powers, principalities, dominations, thrones, cherubim, and seraphim, that there are angels and archangels, all the pages of sacred scripture bear witness. The prophetical books speak often of the seraphim and the cherubim, as we know. Also Paul the Apostle mentions the names of four orders, where he says to the Ephesians, above all principality and power, and virtue and dominion. And again writing to the Colossians, he says, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers. Speaking to the Ephesians, he had already mentioned dominions, principalities, and powers. But being about to speak of these to the Colossians, also he mentions first thrones, of whom he had not spoken to the Ephesians. Therefore, adding thrones to the four orders he had spoken of to the Ephesians, that is, to principalities, powers, virtues, and dominations, five orders are expressly mentioned. Adding to these the angels, archangels, cherubim, and seraphim, we find that there are certainly nine orders of angels. Because of this the prophet says to the angel who was first created, Thou wast the seal of resemblance, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. And let us take note that he does not call him made to the likeness of God, but the seal of resemblance, so that it may be made clear to him that the purer his nature, the more clearly is the image of God stamped on him. And immediately there follows, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the jasper, the chrysolite, and the onyx, and the beryl, the sapphire, and the carbuncle, and the emerald. Here nine names are given of precious stones, because they are without doubt the nine orders of angels. Among these orders he the first stood forth, clothed and adorned with beauty, for as he was placed over all the angelic host in comparison with the others, he was the more gloriously endowed. But why have we touched thus briefly upon these enduring heavenly orders, if not so that we may also say something however brief concerning the ministry they fulfill. Messengers in the Greek tongue are called angels, and the chief messengers are called archangels. We must also know that the name angel refers rather to their office and not to their own nature. For these holy spirits of our heavenly fatherland are indeed always spirits, but cannot always be called angels. For then only are they called angels when by means of them certain things are announced. Accordingly, through the psalmist it is said, Who makes his spirit angels, as though saying, Who, when he call, when he wills, makes angels, or messengers, of those spirits who stand forever in his presence. They who announce things of lesser significance are called angels, and they who announce the greater things are called archangels. Hence, it was not any angel that was sent to the Virgin Mary, but the archangel Gabriel. It was fitting that for this task the highest order of angels should come to announce the one who is above all things. Because of this they are thought to have also particular names, so that by them may be indicated their power and their ministry. That they have proper names is not for the sake of the inhabitants of the holy city, lest they should not be known without them, for there, because of the vision of God, they each enjoy perfect knowledge. But for our sake, for when they come to us on some mission, they take their names from the task they fulfill. Accordingly, Michael is called, who is like to God. Gabriel is, the strength of God. Raphael is called, the medicine of God. And when something of striking power is to be done, Michael is said to be sent, so that by his name and action it may be shown that no one can do what God can do. Because of this, that ancient enemy who through pride desired to be like to God declared, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit in the mountains of the covenant, in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the height of the cloud, 
I will be like to the Most High, is left with his strength until the end of the world, when he is to be punished with extreme torment, when it is said he will meet Michael the archangel in combat, as it is told by John. And there was a great battle in heaven. Michael fought with the dragon, so that he who in pride had exalted himself to the likeness of God, cast down by Michael, learns that by the way of pride no one ascends to the likeness of God. To Mary was sent Gabriel, who is called the strength of God, for he came to announce him who he might cast down the powers of brass, deign to appear among us as one lowly. Of him the psalmist sings, Lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye lifted up, O eternal gates, and the King of glory shall enter in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord who is strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And again, the Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. He therefore was announced by the strength of God, who is the Lord of hosts and mighty in battle, who came to war against the powers of brass. Raphael also, who is, as we have said, the medicine of God, in, as it were, the exercise of his mission, anointed the eyes of Tobias, and wiped away the darkness of his blindness. He, therefore, who is sent to heal, is rightly called the medicine of God. As we have limited ourselves to explaining the particular names of the angels, there remains for us to explain also briefly the words which describe their office. Though spirits are called virtues, through whom signs and wonders are wrought from time to time, they are called powers, who in their order have received this gift more powerfully than the rest received it, so that the hostile virtues, whose powers are curbed, are subject to their word, so that they shall not tempt the hearts of men as they will. They are called principalities, who are placed over the good angels, order the tasks to be done by those subject to them, and rule them in the fulfilling of their offices. They are called dominations, whose powers surpass those of the principalities, by reason of a special distinction. For to be a principality means to stand first among the rest, but to be a dominion means to have all the rest as subjects. That order of angels, therefore, to whom all the rest are subject, since they surpass them all in wondrous power, are called dominations. Thrones they are called upon whom the omnipotent God is ever seated to give judgment. For the Greek word tronos means a seat, and so we say that they are called the thrones of God, who are so filled with the grace of the divinity that the Lord is seated upon them, and through them makes known his judgments. Hence the psalmist says, Thou dost sit upon a throne who judges justice. Again, cherubim means the fullness of knowledge, and these sublime spirits are called cherubim for the reason that contemplating more closely the glory of God, they are filled with a more perfect knowledge of Him, so that the closer, by reason of their rank, they draw near to the vision of their Creator, the more they, in due measure, as creatures, know all things. And these choirs of holy spirits, who because of their special closeness to the Creator, burn with an incomparable love, are called seraphim. For since they are so close to God that no other spirits stand between them and God, the more closely they behold Him, the more ardently they love Him. And their love is a flame, for the more vivid their perception of the glory of the divinity, the more ardently do they burn with His love. But of what use is it to speak of these angelic spirits, unless we seek through fitting reflection upon them, to derive some profit from them for ourselves? For since we believe that the heavenly city is made up of both angels and men, whither we believe men shall ascend to the number of the chosen angels who remain there, as it is written, He appointed the limits of people according to the number of the angels of God, we too should draw something from our earthly contemplation of these different orders of the heavenly citizens for the perfecting of the manner of our own life, and by means of our own zealous devotion excite ourselves to the increase of virtue within us. 
And since we believe that as great will be the multitude of men who will ascend there as the multitude of the angels who remain there, it remains that those among men who are going back to the heavenly fatherland should seek in some measure to resemble the company to which they are returning. For the manner of life of different men clearly corresponds to the diverse orders of the heavenly host, and they are assigned to their order, each in accord with the similarity of their devotion. For there are many who have understanding in small measure, yet they cease not from devoutly announcing these same small matters to their brethren. They accordingly associate with the ranks of angels. And there are some who are filled with the favor of the divine bounty, and able to comprehend and to speak of the highest heavenly secrets. Where shall these be placed, if not among the number of the archangels? And there are others who perform miracles and work great signs and wonders. To whom do they correspond but to the rank and number of the heavenly virtues? And there are those who drive out evil spirits from the bodies that are possessed by them, and they cast them forth by virtue of their prayers and of the power they have received. Where shall they have place, if not among the celestial powers? And there are some who, because of the graces they have received, surpass in merit even the elect, and being better than the good, are even placed over their elect brethren. Where are they received, if not among the number of the principalities? And there are some who have so overcome within themselves all the vices and all desires that, by merit of their purity, they are called gods among men. For this was it said to Moses, Behold, I have appointed thee the god of Pharaoh. With whom will they associate, if not with the order of dominations? And there are some who rule themselves with watchful care, and while examining themselves with anxious zeal, holding fast to the fear of God, receive as the reward of their virtues that they are able to judge others justly. Their minds, being ever held in divine contemplation, God rests upon them as upon a throne, while he examines the actions of other men, and from his seat orders all things wondrously. Who are these but the thrones of the Creator? And with whom shall they be numbered but with the number of the heavenly thrones? By these, as long as the Holy Church is subject to rule, even the elect are sometimes judged regarding certain imperfect acts of theirs. And there are some men who are so filled with the love of God and of their neighbor that they are rightly called cherubim. And since, as we have said above, cherubim means the fullness of knowledge, and as we have learned from the words of Paul that love is the fulfilling of the law, all who are more filled than the rest with the love of God and of their neighbor shall receive the reward of their merits among the ranks of the cherubim. And there are some who, set on fire by the perfections of the heavenly contemplation, breathe only in the love of their Creator, desire nothing more of this world, are nourished solely by this eternal love, cast away whatever is of this earth, pass in their minds above all temporal things. They love and they are on fire, they take their rest, but in this love, Loving they burn, speaking they inflame others, and whom they touch by word they straightway make them begin to burn with the love of God. What shall I call these, if not seraphim? These whose hearts transform to fire burn and give light, for they enlighten the eyes of our mind regarding heavenly things, and moving them to tears they clean away the blight of evil. These then so inflamed with the love of their Creator among whom are they to receive the reward of their calling, if not amid the company of the seraphim? But while I, dearest brethren, am speaking to you of these things, let you turn your minds inward to yourselves, and examine the faults and secret thoughts of your own hearts. See if there be now within you anything of good, whether you shall receive the reward of your calling among the ranks of these angelic choirs, of whom we have briefly spoken to you. Woe to the soul who finds nothing within, however little, of those good things of which we've just been speaking, and yet greater woe threatens it should it see itself empty of these graces 
and yet not grieve because of it. Whosoever therefore this soul may be, my brethren, he is greatly to be grieved over, in that he does not himself grieve. Let us then reflect upon the gifts received by the elect, and let us with all our heart long for a share of such love as they possess. Let him grieve who sees in himself nothing of the grace of these gifts. He who discerns within him a little, let him not envy others who may possess more. For these degrees among the blessed spirits were so ordered that some might be placed over others. It is related that Dionysius, an ancient and venerable father, said that angels are sent forth from the lesser choirs to fulfill certain tasks, visibly or invisibly, namely, that they are sent as angels or archangels for the comfort of men. For the higher choirs of the heavenly host never depart from the inmost depths, and so those above these two ranks are never employed in outward missions. This appears contrary to what Isaiah says. And one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs off the altar, and he touched my mouth. But in this sentence of the prophet we are able to understand that those spirits who are sent receive their name from the office they perform. For the angel who bore a live coal from the altar to purge by fire the sins of speech is called a seraphim, which means fire. This meaning degrees we may well believe with what was said by Daniel. Thousands of thousands ministered to him, and ten times a hundred thousand stood before him. To minister is one thing, to stand before him another. For they who minister to God come to us as his messengers. They who stand before him take their joy in his close contemplation so that they are not at any time sent outwards to fulfill another ministry. But we learn from certain places in Holy Scripture that certain things are done by the seraphim and certain other things by the cherubim. But as to whether they do these things of themselves or whether they are done by their subject choirs, which, as is said, in that they come from the greater spirits, take their name from them, we do not wish to say what we cannot confirm with clear testimonies. But this we know with certitude, that to fulfill a mission from on high some spirits and other spirits, as Zacharias the prophet bears witness, where he says, Behold the angel that spoke in me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And he said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited without walls. Where one angel says to another, Run, speak, there is no doubt but that one sends the other. But they who send are higher in degree than those they send, and this also we firmly hold regarding the angels who are sent to us, that when they come they so outwardly fulfill their mission that never for a moment are they inwardly withdrawn from the divine contemplation. They are therefore sent, and at the same time they assist before God's throne, for though the angelic spirit is circumscribed the Supreme Spirit, who is God, is not. The angels, therefore, are both sent, and they stand before him. For wherever being sent they come, they yet stand within his presence. We must also know that oftentimes these orders of blessed spirits take the names of the orders nearest them. Thrones, for example, the seat of God, as we have said, a special order of the blessed spirits. And yet, as it said by the psalmist, Thou that sittest upon the cherubims shined forth, because within the ranks of the heavenly court the cherubim are joined to the thrones, the Lord is said to be also seated upon the cherubim, because of their proximity to the order next to them. For in that supreme abode there are things that belong to certain orders of spirits, which are yet common to all, and that which each order has in part, this some one order possess fully. But not because of this are they one and all called by the same name. So each order is to be called by the particular name of whatever thing it is receives more fully as its special office. We have spoken of the seraphim as a flame, yet altogether burn with the love of their creator. Cherubim, the fullness of knowledge. 
Yet who among them is unknowing when altogether see God, the fount of all knowledge? Likewise they are called thrones, seated upon whom the Creator rules all things. But who would be blessed if the Creator did not rule from within his soul? These gifts, therefore, which all share in part, are given, together with a special name, to those who have received them more abundantly for their special office. And though there are some possess a certain quality others do not possess, as that for which dominations and principalities receive a particular name, yet all things there are possessed by each single one, because through charity of mind they are possessed by each other. But while we have been exploring the secrets of the heavenly citizens, we have wandered far from the subject of our gospel exposition. We long for those of whom we have been speaking, but we must return to ourselves. We have to remember we are flesh and blood. Let us then be silent regarding the secrets of heaven. But let us, before the eyes of the Lord, and with the hands of repentance, wipe away the stains of our dust. For the divine mercy promises us that there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner that doth penance. And yet the Lord says by his prophet, in whatsoever day the just shall sin, all his justices shall be forgotten. Let us reflect then and see if we can understand the plan of the heavenly justice. To the upright it threatens punishment should they fall. To sinners it promises mercy, that they may struggle to rise. The one it frightens, lest they presume on their justice. The other it cherishes, that they may not despair in their wickedness. If you are a just man, fear his anger if you should fall. You are a sinner, presume on his mercy that you may rise up from sin. But we have already fallen, and we have no will to rise. We lie prone in our evil desires. But he who made us just still waits and calls to us to rise. He opens wide the bosom of his compassion, and he seeks to regain us through repentance. But we cannot do fitting penance unless we also know the measure of this same repentance. For to repent means both to lament the sins we have committed and to refrain from the sins we lament. For the one who grieves over some sins yet continues to commit others either does not know how to repent or but pretends to repent. What good is it for a man to cease from committing the sins of the flesh and still continue to be consumed by the fire of avarice? Or how does it help him if he repents of his sins of anger, while at the same time he is being devoured by envy? Far better to do that which we tell you, that he who grieves over his sins, let him cease from what he grieves for, and he who weeps for his crimes, let him be fearful of committing them again. But we should have this especially in our mind, that whosoever is aware he has done what is unlawful, let him be at pains to deny himself in lawful things, that in this way he may offer satisfaction to his Creator. For he who has done forbidden things should forbid himself in what is allowed him. And he who knows he has sinned in great things, let him now restrain himself from offending in small things. What I tell you matters little unless I am able to declare it together with the testimony of sacred scripture. The law of the Old Testament does indeed forbid a man to covet his neighbor's wife, but it does not forbid under penalty that soldiers be commanded by their king to do heroic things, or that water be thirsted for. And we all know that David, pierced by the sharp edge of lust, desired another man's wife and abducted her. His guilt was chastised with scourges, and with tears of repentance he made amends for the evil he had done. Long after, when he was besieging some of his enemies, and had a great longing for a drink out of the cistern that was in Bethlehem, some of his best soldiers broke through the camp of the enemy, and returned safely with the water the king desired. But this man, humbled by chastisements, of a sudden rebukes himself for desiring to drink water, at the peril of his men's lives, and he sacrificed it to the Lord. As it is written, he offered it to the Lord. The water was poured out in sacrifice to the Lord, 
in that he punished the fault of his concupiscence by the penance of his self-rebuke. He therefore, who before had not feared to desire the wife of another, later feared greatly to drink of the water he had desired. And remembering that he had done forbidden things, severe with himself, he abstains even from what is not forbidden him. Let us repent in this way, if we truly repent of the sins we have committed. Let us keep before us the generosity of our Creator. He sees us sin, and He bears with us. He who before our offense forbids us to sin, after our offense ceases not from wa waiting for us to repent. He whom we have rejected calls after us. We have turned away from Him, but He has not turned from us. Well does Isaiah say, And thy eyes shall see thy teacher, and thy ears shall hear the word of one admonishing thee behind thy back. Man is, as it were, worn to his face, when being created unto justice, he receives the commandments of uprightness. But when he despises these very commandments, he is, as it were, turns the back of his mind on the face of his Maker. But he still follows behind our back, warning us. For though we have rejected him, he does not cease from calling us. We, as it were, turn our backs to him, whose words we despise, whose commandments we tread underfoot. But standing behind our averted backs, he recalls us. He sees us as we despise him, yet he still calls us by his commandments and waits for us in patience. Reflect, therefore, dearest brethren, how should a servant of yours, while you are speaking to him, of a sudden become proud and turn his back on you, would not his affronted master beat down his pride and inflict severe punishment to chastise him? Just so do we turn our back to our Maker when we sin, yet we are suffered in patience. Those turned from him in pride he calls back in mildness, and where he could afflict us as we turn from him, he promises us a reward that we may turn back of ourselves. Therefore let the tenderness of our Creator soften the hardness of our sin. If one man through being beaten could learn the evil he had done, another who was awaited with longing should at least feel ashamed. I shall relate to you very briefly, brethren, something I came to know from the venerable Maximinius, who at the time was a priest and abbot of my own monastery, and is now Bishop of Syracuse. Listen to it carefully, for I believe it will be no little encouragement to your charity. In our time there was a certain Victorinus, also known by the name Amelianus, of no small substance in a modest way, but as will often happen, in the midst of abundance the unchastity of the flesh ruled him, and he fell into a certain wickedness, because of which he began to be afraid and to think deeply of the fearfulness of his own death. And so greatly moved by the remembrance of his own evil doing, he roused himself against himself, abandoned everything of this world, and entered our monastery. In the monastery he gave himself to a life of such humility and austerity that all his brethren, who had themselves grown up in the love of the divinity, seeing his penance were brought to think little of their own life for he strove with all the earnestness of his soul to chastise his body, to break with his own desires, to seek with longing after quiet prayer, bathed continually in tears, seeking to be despised and fearful of the reverence shown to him by his own brethren. He would therefore rise before the hour of the night watch of the brethren, and as there is a more retired spot at one side of the hill upon which the monastery is situated, he used to go out there before the night watch, that he might the more freely, as the more secretly, offer to God the tears of his repentance. His mind dwelt upon the severity of his future judge, and being already of one mind with this same judge, he chased, chastised with tears the guilt of his own past offenses. On a certain night the abbot of the monastery, keeping vigil, saw this monk go quietly out, and followed him. When he saw him prostrate himself in prayer, in a retired part of the mount, he resolved to wait till he would get up again, to learn for himself how steadfast was his prayer. 
And then suddenly a light from heaven flooded the man lying prone upon the ground, and its brilliance was diffused in every direction, so that the whole mount was illuminated by this same light. The abbot, when he saw this, was frightened and fled back to the monastery. And when after a good hour the monk returned to the monastery, the abbot, to find out if he too knew of the splendid light that had shone down upon him, began to question him. Where were you, brother? he said. The brother, believing that he had not been seen, replied that he had been to the mon- been in the monastery. At this answer the abbot was compelled to tell what he had seen. The monk, seeing he was found out, told the abbot something else he did not know. When you saw that light, he said, which descended upon me from heaven, a voice also came to me with it, and said, Your sin is forgiven. The omnipotent God could have forgiven his sin in silence, but speaking with a voice and shining with a great light, he willed, by this manifestation of his mercy, to move our hearts to repentance. Let us not wonder, dearest brethren, that the Lord should cast his persecutor Saul to the ground and speak to him from on high. For here, in our own days, a repentant sinner hears a voice from heaven. To the one was said, Why persecutest thou me? This man merited to hear, Your sin is forgiven. Far lower than Paul in merit is this poor sinner, but as we are here speaking of Saul, breathing threats and slaughter, we may say that Saul heard the words of rebuke because of his pride. This man, because of his humility, merited to hear words of consolation. He whom humility had laid prostrate divine compassion had uplifted, and he whom pride had exalted, the divine severity had thrown to the ground. Therefore, my brethren, have confidence in the compassion of our Creator. Reflect well on what you are now doing, and keep before you the things you have done. Lift up your eyes towards the overflowing compassion of heaven, and while he waits for you, let you draw near in tears to our merciful Judge. Having before your mind that he is a just judge, do not take your sins lightly, and having also in mind that he is compassionate, do not despair. The God-man gives man confidence before God. For those who do penance there is great hope. For then our judge becomes our advocate, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth world without end. Amen. Please go to the next tape.